Hello, everyone. Again, this is Ethan Shapiro, the climate change realtor with Coldwell Banker, founder and manager of the most innovative real estate sales company in the world, here for another episode of Changing the Climate. I am very lucky to have my guest, Mrs. Debbie Miles. Debbie is a geologist, geophysicist, and registered engineer in the state of Colorado. She has spent several decades working for oil and gas, as well as the construction industry. So Debbie, thank you so much for joining me today. I am very happy you've decided to come on and talk with us. It's good to be here. Yeah, it, it's truly a pleasure. So um, I usually love to start these by just getting some background on you and who you are and how you got to where you are today. Well, I came to Colorado to go to Colorado School of Mines. I um, have a master's degree from mines. And then I went into um, actually the mining industry supported my master's degree. And then after that, I went into the oil industry. I've been in Colorado um, looking for oil in various parts of the West for the first 20 years of my um, life. And then I was into the construction industry and I've done a lot of foundation work for construction for houses and other buildings because of my geotechnical engineering. And um, after that, I have been mostly retired. Um, I raised a child here in Boulder and have lived here in Boulder actually since the early 70s. So I've seen a lot of changes in Boulder, a lot of changes in Colorado. And for fun, I'm a ski patroller at Loveland Ski Areas and have been since the 70s as well. Cool. Uh, what kind of changes stand out in your mind in the city of Boulder? I know I've talked to people who have seen crazy change in that time frame. Well, yeah. I mean, all of the building from here to, you know, it used to be that when you hit Broadway out on the north end of town, there was a drive-in theater and there's a lot of open land. And now it's, you know, apartments and buildings and you know, Atlas Flooring used to be a long way from nowhere, <laughs> and they had, you know, a, um, a warehouse there that you could get to by just going across the, you know, going across 36 there at Atlas and, and driving through a dirt hole, and you were at their warehouse. Now there's buildings and stores and everything else around their warehouses. And, um all the canyons, you know, I first came to Boulder, I tried to buy a lot to build a house on that was up on the um, one of the ridges above, uh, basically, a, in north town, north of town, and you'd come off of um, the main highway out of town um, was basically up left hand canyon and then turned left to get to one of those locations. And the most expensive lot in Boulder at the time had sold for $11,000 and they were asking $100,000 for the lot on the ridge. No kidding. Yeah, it was like, I couldn't believe it because I was sitting there trying to figure out, yeah, I can borrow this much money and I could buy that lot <laughs> and then I can slowly build a house. But no, I can't even do that. No. It was so out of outrageous. And yes, my first house that I bought in Table Mesa was $28,000. Yep. No more. <laughs> so I been hear, here hear a long time. Say. And now I can't <laughs> touch that house for 750. <laughs> oh, easily, easily at this point. So speaking of, of housing, do you want to tell everyone how we met and how we kind of got to this point where you're on my podcast now? Well, yeah, you were walking the streets and I was out in front of my house on Kendall Drive and uh, we started talking and I started talking about, you know, the sun and how the sun was doing some strange things because... Mm -hmm. The ski industry is very well much aware of the 11 year cycle for the sun. And it really told us the dry years, the wet years, the cold years, the warmer years. And it was pretty close, although the sun in the last 20 years has been doing some very, very strange things. Um, originally, we had thought that when, during the Maunder Minimum, when they said there were no sunspots, that that couldn't possibly be true. It was probably an observational error. They couldn't see very well, so they didn't see the sunspots that were there. But in 2000, we had what they now call a cue ball sun, which means there are no sunspots on the sun. And that was amazing to all the solar people because prior to that, the lowest was like 80 or 90, a sunspot number around 80 or 90. What is a sunspot? 
Okay, a sunspot is a small storm on the sun and it releases some energy from the sun and the sun is constantly releasing this energy from deep within the sun out onto the surface and you get small sunspots. When you don't have sunspots, that energy still needs to be released. So we get solar flares and solar storms mm -hmm. and things like that. And so um, the lower the sunspots, the more the solar flares, the higher the sunspots, the fewer. And a solar flare will inter you know, interrupts the um, radio frequencies on Earth so NASA and the Department of Defense and people like that have always been interested in these solar flares. So they've been trying to actively predict and look at the sun since about the 1940s and 50s. So that they knew when their radio waves are going to have problems and could, you know, basically be ready for it. Because anything that happens on the sun, it takes about a day to two days to get here. Mm -hmm. So you have... You see it on the sun, you have a little bit of time before it shows up. And in, I think it's called geological time, um, or maybe that's just on Earth, that this 20, 30 years for the sun is equivalent of a, a tenth of a second for a human, right? Or even less. The sun is, right. is billions of years old, or is it, yes. is it trillions of years old? I don't know. It's somewhere in the billions of years. We okay. know the Earth is four to six billion years old. Right. Um, we always thought it was 4 billion years. It's now being pushed back to about 6 billion years. No kidding. The sun, um, if you, when the Big Bang occurred, which is, I don't know how many years, because I haven't thought about how long ago that was. But when that <laughs> occurred, it sent things out into the various space. And those things coalesced around each other because of the way the swirlings worked and things like that. That I'm fuzzy on, on the astrophysics and any physicist will tell me how fuzzy I am. <laughs> well, that's funny. The Big Bang is, is still a theory, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. And we keep trying to figure out things that don't work, but it is a discontinuity in time. And so there is a point at which we cannot, nothing on, of our observations goes beyond that, goes back farther than that. Right. So and that's why... It's held as a theory. And the Earth is, ex I mean, the uh, universe is currently expanding in all directions. Definitely. And I think something we'll, we'll talk about a lot today is, is how much we, we truly don't know. It, correct me if I'm wrong, 70% or so of the universe is composed of this, this dark matter stuff, which we have no idea what it is. Is that right? Yes. And that's only about a 10-year-old theory. Right. So we're constantly learning new things and changing and getting new information. And I think you're, you're one of your biggest gripes with this, this climate change, call it a theory or phenomenon of what's going on, is, is the certainty that people take on, on it. Am, am I on, on the right path? Yeah. Yeah. And we're not really sure what all changes um, climate. Uh, we have things that happen in 100-year cycles, things that happen in 300-year cycles, things that happen in 11-year cycles, things that happen in 3,000-year cycles, things that happen in you know, 40,000-year cycles, and things like that. So we're not really, it's a whole bunch of different cycles put on mm -hmm. top of each other, not the least of which probably the sun is a major important part of it. And how much energy is coming out of the sun and how the sun, you know, sends that energy to us are all part of this system. And um, the Maunder Minimum started a little ice age. And we only sort of understand what that is. It's more observational right now. We don't know why. We just saw it happen. So, um, and that's the two big things is we need to find the whys, but we also have to observe what is going on. Definitely. So let me explain to you where I'm at at the moment in a simple terms. There's all sorts of things we can talk about. I spoke to the head of the environmental studies program at CU yesterday. And basically the way I understand what I call the problem of climate change is human beings are reliant on carbon-based energy and 
I suppose, burning carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere, which then creates a blanket, which, which makes the, the earth itself, the average temperature go up. And this causes detriment, detrimental problems to life on earth. So the way I see it, the more carbon we put into the atmosphere, the more living beings that will, will die. And that, and I see evidence from that in numerous studies. And, and that's kind of the part that I have hard, a hard time with because mm -hmm. geologically, this doesn't make sense. Okay. In the Silurian um, with, and Devonian, which are about 250 million years ago. Are those time periods? Like, those are the, time Creta periods, like the Cretaceous time and the Jurassic, like when dinosaurs. Right. Okay. And they predate the Cretaceous and the Jurassic. Cool. About 4 billion years ago, the Earth started the first basically three, about, well, four to six. And then at about 500,000 to 600,000 or 600 million years ago, life showed up on Earth in a form that we now recognize <laughs> as being, you know, more than just amoebas and uh, mosses and multicellular. Algae. Or, or even more, or even more than that. More, more than multicellular, because algaes can be multicellular. Okay. But we became beings, um, things like fish, things like plants, things like humans, you know, things that actually had a lot of cells working together in a symbiotic relationship that created a living being. Do you think something um, prompted that? We don't know. Of course, we don't know. We know we don't that know it anything. happened about 600 million years ago. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what we know. Okay. And we know that animals and uh, plants both develop, plants develop a, um, a cell wall so they could be out on the earth. Mm. Um, and part of what caused that is the earth had no oxygen in the atmosphere for many billions of years and an anaerobic life meaning a life without oxygen, showed up, it turned CO2 into uh, oxygen and other things into oxygen and created an atmosphere that had oxygen in it. And at that point, then the aerobic beings showed up. And the aerobic things take, took over from the anaerobic. And it may be as crazy as the mitochondria in your cells is an anaerobic bug from back then that went into a, an animal cell so that it could live in an anaerobic environment. Right. And so it's that really would... crazy. What we're learning is really somewhere beyond crazy about It's life. amazing. All of it is. Yes. Always. And so, but the thing though in science is nothing is ever absolutely proved. And it only takes one circumstance to say, nope, that's not real. We have to change our hypothesis. And so I have a question. Um, as far as the, the theory of relativity, now this is way out of my, my pay grade <laughs> or whatever, but um, is like quantum mechanics working on disproving the, the theory of relativity? Is that, is that my, am I in the right ballpark when I say something they like that? They have been working on that. And in parts of quantum mechanics, relativity goes belly up. And there are things where, because you observed it, it existed. Mm -hmm. and, and so we get into almost a philosophy in the physics. Love it. And, um, you know, so relativity is good for a certain area, time, and size of, of system. And it goes belly up when you get down in the quantum world. And it doesn't go belly up when you get into the um, solar world you know, the solar um, system world, which is huge. I mean, it's beyond our belief how huge it is. It's so, all of it is so incredible. And if there's, if there's a, just a great piece of evidence that we'll, we'll never know it all, it's, I, I once saw a website where you could zoom in all the way to a plank and then yes. zoom all the way out to the perceived universe, or whatever. And there's so much going on. And that's just a simulation that just doesn't even have a, like a back to, you know, a 10th of a percent of what's actually out there. People, people don't talk about this kind of stuff because like you said, relativity might explain the universe uh, or the, the out 
ex external universe, but doesn't explain like the molecular uh, below molecular. And people want to be like, nope, that's the way it works. I don't want to embrace the the true darkness of we don't really know anything. I think is what right. it is. Well, when I was first learning in science, you know, the electron was the smallest thing, mm. and then there were pieces, you know, quarks and They're and all quarks, kinds of yeah. stuff and, and things that are even tinier. And that have major parts of it. And when Fenneman has his theory about um, atoms, it's a good working theory for part of it. And then the rest of it doesn't fit. As you find out more and more what goes on in the nucleus of an atom, more and more what goes on in electrons, things fit, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's always evolving. And we're always trying to find out more and more things about different parts. But again, that's not my world. I'm only mm -hmm. bluffingly familiar with the physics. <laughs> yeah. Real world. I'm in the human size physics. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> you know, things that come in, in meters and, and feet and yards and stuff like As that. As most of us are. Yeah. I can understand miles. I can understand yards. Of course you can. Inches. Debbie <laughs> miles. Cool. Yeah. So before I, I want to give you a chance to kind of share everything you have on your mind throughout our last few weeks of discussion, but I just want to, to, to make clear, I think we, and then I think with all people who have disagreement, we're in agreement on most things. So as far as plastic pollution goes, you agree, that's probably a very, a very big problem that we should handle. No. Yes, that is a very big problem. Um, and I see, I would like to see things like a better way of maybe burning plastic or maybe of recycling plastic. Okay. Um, there are things like, you know, the cornstarch require that's turned into plastic requires a large amount of energy. So we have to keep, wor you know, working within the, every time you try to add a carbon to a carbon, you know, a multi-carbon molecule, it takes a lot of energy. And if you can start with a long chain carbon molecule and cut it up, it takes very little energy. If you start with a short chain carbon molecule and add to it, it takes a lot of energy. And so that's what I see in the corn and the carbohydrates of corn and things like that. You're adding carbon to them. And so it takes a lot of energy to do that to create the plastic, even though the plastic is then very disposable because it's going to compost. But you may want to think about, you know, other ways of doing that or other systems to reuse the plastic. Um, you know, recycling plastic is excellent because mm -hmm. it's a really good way of keeping the carbon chains together. Someone I had spoken to a few weeks ago had said that plastic can actually only be recycled twice. Okay. So then maybe at that point we want to use it as a fuel. Okay. So that that's, I just want to, all right, fair enough. So, um, and then my second one would be, would you generally agree that loss of the, of biodiversity is, is generally a negative thing or could there be some yes. sort of redeeming quality to it? It generally is a negative thing. Okay. Um, but the earth is always constantly changing. The only thing constant about the earth is that it's changing. Mm. The only thing constant about life is that it's changing. Even Absolutely. yours and my life are changing daily. We're moving right now. Yeah, the earth is moving around the sun and the, and the earth is spinning. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff we just can't perceive with our little brains, our little eight brains. Right. And, and so, and even that, you know, in the 1860s saying your little eight brain would have been incredibly controversial, incredibly not the consensus of science, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it just, we are going to change. We are going to have more information. And the exciting part right now is our information is exploding at a speed that very few of us can actually keep up with or even hardly comprehend. That's why I talk to people who are smarter than me like you. So you can help me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my last, I'm just curious about your thoughts on sea level rise. I am not sure how much sea level is rising and how much earth, the uh, land is going like down. Because like in Florida, when you take the fresh water out of the ground below you, the ground sinks. And so when you have higher tides, is it because you have changed the level of your ground because you've caused it to sink because you've removed the water that's holding it up? Or is it because the tides are higher? 
And um, the things I see on the NASA um, satellites uh, making measurements is that the oceans probably are not changing that much. And that the most likely thing is the ground is going down rather than the ocean is going up. And so that's like sitting in your car and the guy next to you is moving and you think you're moving. <laughs> But you're okay. not because the guy next to you is. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know anything about now, that. I have no idea right now at, at that point. What's Glacial going melt on. seems to be Glacial the main melt. thing that causes the ocean to rise from what I can tell. Right. But also Calgary had 3,000 feet of ice on it in uh, 15,000 years ago. And it is now going up because all of the continents float on the mantle and we can measure a rise in Calgary as it is recovering from, you know, it's going up because the weight on it is taken off. So that's your little boat in your, your pond. If you've got, you know, 10 rocks in it, if you take the rocks out, the boat rises to a higher level. The same thing's happening with the earth. As the glaciers come off, the land area is actually coming up. And it's called the eustatic, um, you know, recovery from the fact that the ice weighed so much and pushed it down. So there's a lot of different moving parts in this system. And I think we can, we can take away the fact that it, everything is in a constant state of motion. And I think it's, yes. it's, it's hard to see uh, if you're in one place, but if you study everything, you can see how much is, is truly going on at once. Right. Um, and 15,000 years ago, off the coast of Oregon and Washington, the ocean was 400 feet lower than it is right now. And the um, indigenous people probably came down the coast line at the coast 400 feet below where it is now, which is how come we think, it's the best guess right now, why people show up in New Mexico 15,000 years ago, but there's no trace of where they came from. They just suddenly are there. Interesting. And so, um, that's, you know, that's part of the anthropological, you know, anth um, the other, you know, that's part of um, the world of, of the ancient, how people moved down here, why the um, land bridge was available at, up in Alaska, um, how these people are related to uh, people on the Asian continent, things like that. So it's a really interesting pull, but I found out about this back in um, 1970 when I was studying geology at Portland State. We were looking at the foundation for the Trojan nuclear plant on the Columbia River and discovered that the Columbia River channels were 400 feet lower than the current surface of the channel. So they had been dug 400 feet lower and now were filled up to the current level of the channel because of the ocean being 400 feet lower than it currently is. So these are all things that happen. And that was when we had huge glaciers, you know, continental glaciers throughout Colorado, throughout, you know, there were 3,000 feet of ice on Calgary. There was 1,000 feet of ice on Chicago. You know, all these different places were covered with ice and it was a huge weight of ice. Um, and it caused all kinds of fun and interesting things like the Bonneville floods and stuff like that. Right. Oh, cool. And all right. So, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So at this point, I kind of want to transition and kind of give you, give you the floor here where, where I'm at. I'm a very, I'm a, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I don't really believe I, I know anything, but from what I can perceive and the position I've taken, I kind of create purpose for myself and find my own place in the world. And I'm obviously building this climate change realty brand. And the way I see it is we're in this existential crisis where we're in a potential mass extinction event. And I believe you have a different opinion from that. And I understand that we're all conditioned by the information that we consume, whether it's through the media, through the parents, through our, our schools, whatever it may be. And I really want to give you a chance to, to show your perspective. I know you have a couple things prepared. So I'm just really excited to hear what you have to say as far as this climate crisis is what I would call it. And what I would like to say is hysteria doesn't do anything for anybody. So the word crisis to me is problematic. What about climate during a war? If like, if there's hysteria, does that, does that stir people to fight the war? 
Well, the question is, what is what should the fight be? Okay. I am in agreement that we absolutely have to maintain the earth as a place to live, as a place for our child, children to live, as a place where we can grow food, as a place where we can, you know, basically enjoy skiing. I don't want to see the mountains disappear or anything like that. Um, I really, you know, I started recycling aluminum in 1978 because an aluminum you. can, you can basically recycle 95% of the energy used to make the original can. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. That's where all the aluminum plants are. And why are the aluminum plants there? Because hydroelectric energy was coming into um, fruition at that point. And so it was a very cheap energy to create aluminum cans. And recycling that aluminum can recycled the hydroelectric energy. So I've been doing that forever. And that made a lot of sense. And I want to do the things that make sense that don't take more energy to recycle or to change than they do actually create. Um, one of the things we, the other thing I was, I'm looking at is in politics and in law, there is the thought that consensus is the way to go because in law you normally go into and nothing is disproved. The premise for a lawyer or for a politician a lot of time is to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt or prove it beyond a doubt. It never doesn't have any place to say you didn't do it. It just has a place to say we didn't prove it. Mm -hmm. And so I see that more in this idea that the consensus is, because the consensus comes from the idea that we can't disprove it, but we do show it by a consensus. And in science, that's always gotten science into trouble. The consensus has never worked. The consensus mm -hmm. of the earth is flat never worked. You know, it's shot, we found to get to real science, we had to get beyond that consensus. The consensus that the sun um, moved around the earth was, was something we had to get beyond to create a circular earth to create the world we know now in our minds. So it's, it's more of a theory. So what I kind of, a couple of things that I would like to see Mm -hmm. um, is some of the, some background. And um, she's, the idea we're, we're, that- We're getting that, something up on the screen here now, folks. Yeah. She's the got, she's, she's prepared. The burn naturally, and oil seeps also come out naturally. So the oil is seeping out. There is 3 million barrels a day of oil coming out of the Caribbean and we know for sure it's been coming out since the Spaniards and, and the Naturally, Italians. without human in interference. Without human interference. Because the Spaniards and the um, Italians had on their maps a location where you could um, sail to in the Caribbean to get oil to put on the side of your ship so that you didn't sink on the way home. Hmm. So you re... Um, you know, basically waterproofed your ship with the oil that was coming to the surface. You also had to know you had to, to stay away from it because oil is less dense than water. And so your ship would sink if you went over the top of that and it was too big. So you wanted to be a certain distance from it, but you wanted to be close enough that you could, you know, put things into the water and then paint your ship with the oil coming up. Is there anything from this slide? Do you want, do you want me to read, read it out to people who might be listening? Um, any um, of the bullet points that you think are important? So basically we those, have- a th those are a, the importance, yeah. I've got that. And in North America, all well, of the oil seams that have come to the surface are burning. When an oil seam, when, when I mean coal- Meaning, when coal meaning it'll go the into surface, the atmosphere. It, it burns. burns. Yes. Yeah, it immediately starts fire because something turns- um, catches it on fire within 10 to 15 years that it is exposed. All right. So let so me just, let me just read this. So people who are listening can hear nearly all coal seams in North America are burning though. There is little fly ash. All of the other pollutants are being sent into the atmosphere. So what she's saying, nearly 3 million barrels of oil leak naturally in the Caribbean daily, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's for a long time. It's been going on for a while and they burn and are going into the atmosphere. Okay. So there's naturally 
So um, there's a oil. lot of natural fossil fuels going into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and so, let's see, let's go right there. So that was kind of one of the places that a lot of this stuff is natural. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where I'm really coming from and the bottom line that I'm coming from is not that we can stop all this, but that we can A, make our lives uh, work with what is the changes and make the changes happen you know, allow the changes to happen with us being, you know, mitigating those changes a lot better than trying to change our entire life to cover those changes. Okay. Okay. So uh, one of the big things is how much, you know, one of the things that it took a long time to find out because um, I'm not sure anybody wanted to know. <laughs> Nobody but, wants to hear the opposing viewpoints opinion because they're evil, right? Well, no, but but there is this one is harder to work with. Okay. And that's the problem. So I'm gonna share it one more time. Go ahead. And and, and make um, sure we can if something's important, we want to read it out so people who are listening can hear. Okay, so these are simple things. If you want to hear it, the weight of the atmosphere is five point five times ten to the eighteenth tons. Five point five gigatons. Heavy. Okay. The current CO2 levels are represented as 485 parts per million. That's Which PPM. used to be 270 back in right. the 1900s, right? Right. It could be, and some people think it's as low as 385, and we can talk about that. But anyway, okay. what does that mean? So that's 485 times 10 to the minus 6 added in, in this 500 and 5.5 times 10 to the 18th. So what does this look like in real numbers? What does, okay, go ahead, yeah. So 485, that means that it's 485 times 10 to the 12th ton of CO2. 485 trillion tons. Cool. Whoops, back up, sorry. No worries. So how much does CO2 do we produce with cars? The estimate is that we'll save 10 billion tons if we only have electric cars. And that's all, everyone who, dri who drives going electric, we would save 10 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay. So in 100 years, we save 1 trillion tons. That means we change 45 to 46 or 45 to 44, depending on how you want to look at it. We yeah, change so let's, only that last number. Let's, let's make this very clear here. So the estimate is if everyone drives electric cars, we'll save 10 billion tons of carbon per year. So over 10 years, that would be 1 trillion tons. Is that right? And you're saying over 100 no. years, that no, would be 10, 1 trillion. Yeah. 10, that would be a, yeah, no, 100, 100, 100 years is a trillion tons because a trillion is a thousand billion. And right now we have 485 trillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. Is that right? Yes. Which is a very small percentage of the total weight of the atmosphere. If we drive electric cars for 100 years, we're, we're saying out of 485, that will make the number go down by one from what it is at now. Right. Sure. Or, okay. or whatever, up or down or wherever, or wherever it is in the future. It'll change mm -hmm. it by one. Yes. And so that is kind of like... But that's not even talking about all of the other things that are associated with creating um, electric cars and stuff like that. And, and all of, of the um, systems. Like precious required. metals and different right. things and for batteries. And mining and all that other stuff. That is assuming that cars are zero carbon, which is a really, really poor assumption because of where all the carbon is. So people like me look at this and say, yeah, I understand that the climate is changing. I know that it's been changing for the last 15,000 years because we know that there is an ice on uh, Calgary. There's no ice. You know, our, our um, glaciers in the mountains have been, you know, basically shrinking for the last whatever humans can measure. I mean, since we've been here, since humans have walked in and looked for gold, the uh, glaciers have been, have been um, getting smaller and things like that. And we know that like on Greenland, um, in 800 common era, the, um, um, 
Vikings have records, historical records, about people living on Greenland, about people raising sheep and, and having a thriving colony there. And they have an exact date in the late 800s where the Vikings were run off of Greenland. Actually, they starved because they couldn't get off fast enough before everybody starved because the weather changed and Greenland became more cold and the glaciers on Greenland actually covered some of the Viking settlements. And this now is 800 AD? 800 AD or CE actually is your... Whatever. And, and now the, um, the archaeologists are finding these Viking settlements because the glaciers are retreating so that you can see the settlements of the Vikings. Mm. And the Scandinavians are very interested in that because that's their heritage and their world. And it shows that they were off and running. And this place they called Vineland was actually the, um, you know, the new world as, as the Europeans called it, or home as the indigenous called it. Um, and they had seen it in 800. And they have um, people from Iceland who traveled to Greenland who traveled to Vineland and who traveled back to Iceland and lived out their lives in Iceland in the 800s. So it's, you know, all kinds of things are changing and all kinds of things happen. Sure. Um, And then, so let, but my, my real concern is what would a world without fossil fuels look like? A utopia. Yeah, exactly. Everyone gets along and holds hands and we all say kumbaya. Exactly. And so it requires electric cars or no cars at all. Okay. Um, All electric houses, no natural gas for your hot water heater, no natural gas for your um, furnace. Mm -hmm. And in 1978, all electric houses were running $300 a month and... (laughs) And uh, natural gas houses were running seventy-five to eighty dollars a month in wow. utility costs. I mean, that's. But what do we get from all of these fossil fuels? That means no tires on your car, no hoses in your car of any kind. Why is that? Um, if you from the fossil fuels, tires on your car come from oil. Okay. Hoses in your cars come from oil. The seats in your car come from oil. So are we going to do away with all of those? Are we going to have metal seats? Are we going to have leather seats? So then we're going to have to grow more cows. Um, Cell phones go away because most of the things in your cell phone are from a petrochemical. Clothes and coats, most of your clothes that you're wearing are a polyester or a non-cotton, non-wool material. But can Um, we not uh, adapt all these things and, and create better versions of what already exists? Well, if you want to make them from, if you want to make better polyesters, you either recycle the existing or you bring oil out of the ground to create them. What about like cotton? Cotton is a natural fiber. Okay. It just grows. So okay, we're so good. cotton we're good and on wool, that. cotton and wool are fine, but nothing stretchy in your in, um, thing. So you're back to, you know, things like you have to have a rope to keep your pants up because stretchy things don't happen. Um, You know, things like that. We're back to your earbuds go away. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Because can you imagine your earbuds made out of cotton or wool? No. So there's a lot of things. The insulation in your house comes from, you know, some of it is fiberglass, but a lot of it is our various oil-based systems. All the vapor barriers on houses now um, all of your Trex materials. Hold all on, of your... hold on. But it, is it not fair that we? it's possible for us to create better technology? Is that not what we do best as people? And wasn't it an, um, some sort of threat of danger, a good way to incent? I don't like being incentivized by fear, but a necessity, we'll call it, a, a good incentive for increasing necessity technology? Necessity is always the mother of invention. Right. Always. Period. And so whatever the necessity is, is if inventions come with it. Uh But what happens is, is when you create an artificial necessity. So is it truly a crisis or is it something else? Right now, um, you know, our boats, our kayaks, our skis, our ski boots, um, 
everything, you know, if I was to take away everything that was made from oil, A, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And B, our houses wouldn't be warm. So where do we really want to go? Do we really want to get rid of fossil fuels? Um, all of our food is contained in plastics, which keeps it cleaner. It keeps it more, you know, there are better things that happen to it. Um, a lot of people got really uptight about the idea that you um, took products that were already packaged and put them into a gamma ray system, which basically then you would sterilize the food. Um, that's closer to being something like um, you know pasteurizing milk, which took away a lot of foodborne um, problems. And mm-hmm. we've gotten rid of that, but there are a lot of things that we can learn and a lot of places, but putting food in plastic keeps it from having foodborne illnesses. Okay. Keeping foods in refrigerators keeps us from having you know, foodborne illness, illnesses and allows us to buy food on Monday and not eat it till Thursday and things like that. So a refrigerator is going to require electricity. So what do we do to get enough electricity to A, run all the cars, B, run all the houses and do all the things right now, which we don't normally do with electricity, which is including heating your house, heating your uh, water and heating your cars and running your oh, cars. We, oh, it's simple. We just sell billions of dollars worth of real estate and that'll, that'll solve everything. But can you even sell that real estate if it's covered with solar cells? <laughs> And, and how have we and have we hurt the animal population and the food production if we need solar cells? Now, how many solar cells can we afford to have before we start hurting the food production and start hurting the habitats for animals? How, how so? How do solar cells hurt food? Food because you have to have a place to have them. Okay. You know, so go down land. 93, and on the left, you'll see a solar farm. Mm-hmm. Nothing grows under that solar farm. So any habitat that existed there, whether you don't like um, prairie dogs or not, or birds or moles or whatever that the, um, you know, the raptors and other things eat, can't grow there. And so how much of that, and then we can't grow food there either. So do you cover Iowa with solar cells and then no, don't grow food? So then, the, so that's the question. And how many solar cells are required to have enough energy to run all the houses, heat them, heat your water, and run your cars? So that becomes a real question. And so that's part of this plan that hasn't been looked at. And, you know, if we take Boulder and say, okay, Boulder gets 20% of its power from solar or from uh, renewables, what they call renewables. Um, so where does that 20% come from? It comes from all over the state of Colorado, because we're assuming that all the renewables in the state of Colorado are really running Boulder to get to 20%. And if you actually look at the needs of the state, you're about one or 2% of the total needs of the state. If you weren't going to say, well, Boulder's paying for it, so therefore Boulder gets to claim it. Mm -hmm. Um, if Boulder tried to claim or tried to get to 100%, we'd have to have solar cells on every house, and we'd have to find another area where we can A, put in uh, wind farms, Mm -hmm. and B, put in solar cells. And that's a lot of area. And you can't put the windmills any closer than one every 15 or 20 acres, because when you put in a, a windmill, it removes the energy from the atmosphere, so right behind it, there is no wind. So you have to put the windmills we such that, wind. that's why you see them in a long line. Mm-hmm. And then you see another long line a distance away from them. And so they that's, can't put them on top of each other. You have to put them away. And no one has asked the question, how much does taking the energy from the wind out of the wind change the climate downwind from these wind farms? What is no longer downwind from the wind farms because the winds take wind farms take the energy out of the wind because on the back side there is no wind. That's very that's very interesting. 
<coughs> we know that there are some rain shadows caused by the wind farms between here and Oregon. And we've seen new rain shadows because of that. And so what, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big picture and the picture isn't just, let's put solar on everybody's roof and then we can live happily because everybody can run on electricity. Mm -hmm. But it's not really that way. Um, and I understand. So, you know, so I have two big points. You know, one point is, are we really changing anything? Because if we're only changing the last number, obviously there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that is changing the 485, because we've gone from 200 and something Seven, to yeah. 400 and something. So, and we've you only changed it by one, you know, or two. Okay. So how do we get, how do we, you know, figure out all of what's going on truly and how much of that is real? Because the limestones that are exposed in Canada, when the rain rains on them, they give off CO2. Mm hmm the, um, you know, and so there's a lot of different things that happen just because of light. Now, one of the good things that's happening is that the earth is, is greener. Um, NASA's measurements of the earth say that our vegetation is greener, which means we have what more vegetation. Mean? We have more vegetation. So if you grow bigger plants, you can feed people more easily because you have bigger corn, bigger everything. So you can feed people more easily and you can develop new products from things that grow better in a higher CO2 environment. Earth is greener when as compared to, wh to when? During NASA's measurements. Mm -hmm. So from about the 1960s to now, their satellite measurements show the Earth is having a greener color. Okay. Um, so we're, we're getting towards the end here because I don't want to make this podcast too long. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to bring up everything you want to say. I've appreciated everything you've said so far. It's been very interesting. But what I didn't really like is the analogy you used of climate change as a court case. And I do certainly agree that people, or I wouldn't say I certainly agree, but generally the way it works is someone is, is, is innocent until proven guilty. But the thing with a trial is that one person is put on trial against essentially the, the entire society is trying to determine if this person's a criminal and we're trying to determine if one person is, if they're guilty, they go to jail. The thing with climate change is if, if, it's, if we, the humans, are guilty of causing climate change, the result is death for everyone. So I just didn't really, I didn't really see the value yeah, in that see, analogy. That's the interesting part. And the analogy is that it's not a consensus. We're in the legal world, the political world, we're used to going in and saying, we can prove A or we can prove B, and we prove it by consensus. Is anything really ever a true consensus where everyone agrees on it, though? Yeah, well, climate change is trying to say that they are real because they are a consensus. And so that's what I'm trying to get at, is people understand consensus because they're used to it in their political legal world. Not mm -hmm. necessarily that anybody is on trial for anything, but a consensus is the world of politics slash law slash that half, that, that set of sciences. Whereas in science, consensus is not a part of science. Science, you can have Skepticism. a consensus on something and then Darwin walks in and says, no, people change because of evolution and because you know, this one animal survived instead of this other animal. And a true scientist who's dedicated to their craft would love nothing more than to have their entire life's work proven wrong because then they know they're advancing the cause, not just their own right. ego. Or even change... Most of the time in science, it's not truly a proven wrong. It's just a deviation to the right or to the left or to wherever uh, you want. You know, it's kind of like we're still, we still believe in evolution, but we've got a whole bunch of new nuances that go with it. And, and the world is a lot more nuanced than Darwin ever dreamed. Yeah. You know? but, but he would love it because it's, you know, starting with his idea the nuances show how different it is or how better it is. And see, we're not allowing 
climate change to have any nuances. We're not allowing ourselves to say, okay, the models that we had in the 1990s didn't work because England still has snow. They said that England would be snow free by 2010 and, and the English would dearly love to have been snow free in 2019 and 2018. Um, but, you know, things like that. So we aren't taking reality and seeing how that is shifting our understanding. And so, because our understanding is just saying, well, no, we know this is happening. So, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, we know absolute guarantee every scientist who's ever studied the earth will guarantee you that the climate is changing. Absolute guarantee. The question is, A, are people causing any nuanced changes or not? And B, um, what are the real reasons why the climate has changed? Because we don't understand why we've had ice ages versus not ice ages. We don't understand why there was 1,200 parts per million um, CO2 in the Cretaceous versus 900 in the first period just immediately after. We suspect it was, you know, the meteor is part of it. And we're now, um, the meteor hitting the earth and causing the mass extinction is being nuanced into more things are happening and more reasons are part of that extinction. But, once you, but you have to have the meteor before you can start working with all of the nuances that make reality and make the actual facts. And um, there was, you know, there were also during the Cretaceous, we had trees that lived above the Northern Circle, the Arctic Circle, and they lived in a, in a half a year that was dark because it was still dark above the North, the Arctic Circle, even though it didn't freeze mm. above the Arctic Circle. And so we have a whole system of plants and animals that lived up there during the Cretaceous. We know from the uh, diggings in Edmonton and north of Edmonton that this happened. And so now we can nuance even new ways of trees and other things surviving a nighttime that lasts from sometime in the November till sometime in January, February, depending mm -hmm. on how far north you are. But it was a temperate forest. The forest did not freeze. And so there's a lot of things that we have to understand the nuances in um, by getting stuck on a single thread. We may be depriving ourselves of understanding all the nuances. And so having your house use natural gas is actually cleaner than having a power plant ship electricity to you because the natural gas in your house only puts out CO2 and water, whereas the power plant puts out other things. Although our new coal plants are getting to the point where the only thing coming out of the smokestack is CO2. And that CO2 can be caught and used in the oil industry to extract more oil from the ground. And those longer carbon chains means we don't have to put energy into the system to create the plastics and other things and the pharmaceuticals and all the stuff that come out of the petrochemical industry. So it's an interesting nuance in really wanting to have a clean environment. I really don't want my neighbor burning his coal-fired um, furnace anymore. And I'm happy that it got, it went away about 10 years ago. but you know, um, natural gas is a really good way to um, heat your water, heat your house. It's probably also a very good way to run um, your air, air conditioner, although it's a much more interesting, nuanced way to run your air conditioner. And I'd love to see, if I could have a natural gas air conditioner, I would, because we have okay. natural gas and propane refrigerators. And so it's a similar technology, it's just it hasn't been put into a air conditioner at this point in time and run right, it off right. instead of electricity. And so then cut my electrical use in my house very significantly. And so there are things like that I'd like to see. I'd like to see my cars run on natural gas or propane, which is right now economic to do. It's even economic to switch my car from gas to natural gas. 
there isn't quite as much energy density in the natural gas, but it still runs my car very nicely. So there's a lot of things I would really like to see because I see the problem with cars burning gasoline is all of the garf that comes out of the uh, tailpipe mm -hmm. and having them burn either propane or natural gas or hydrogen. There's nothing coming out of the tailpipe. Interesting. And so you get rid of a whole bunch of the pollution that I really don't want to see in this state. And yeah. those are the kinds of directions I see as more optimal to having everybody put solar cells on their uh, roof. I understand. And it's really been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I really, really do appreciate you coming on and sharing your point of view because it is everyone's point of view is valuable. And especially you who studied science for, for so many years. Um, to conclude here, I'm just curious, what would you recommend to, to us young folks who are passionate about climate change and those, this, this sort of polarization we're dealing with at the moment where people don't want to listen to each other? What kind of advice can you give to people to get them to communicate so we can come to a conclusion that works for everyone? I wish I knew. Um, what <laughs> Good I, response. <laughs> what I see is we need to take your team, my team, out of politics. Right. So if it wasn't Democrats versus Republicans and I am on the Democrat team or I am on the Republican team, that would help a whole bunch because then we could start talking about, I like this guy and his policies because I think these policies work. And we can discuss, okay, will that policy work or will that policy cause us problems? Will this policy work or will this policy cause us problems? Do we want government to be the answer or do we want people to be the answer? Those are the kinds of things, rather than saying, oh, I want a Democrat in the office because he's much better. Or I want to destroy the person who's currently in, in a office and office. You know, we can pick any politician and we can say people are talking about how they personally are a pain in the rear. And that's not a good thing. I mean, you know, we can run through all of the politicians in this state and tell you all of the nasty things said about each one. I don't right. care. I want to know what kinds of policies are they going to, you know, do. Okay, yeah, so I, or support. Is a, is a government a good, you know, source of solutions or is individual private industry a good source of solutions? That's the questions I really want to be asking. Some solutions are better done by government. Some solutions are better done by private industry. Let's see which ones should be done by government, which ones should be done by private industry. Uh, let's see. Uh, let, let's see <laughs> means uh, let's get ready to throw some fists. Um, no, I don't want to throw fists. I just want to talk I know about, you don't. <laughs> you know, how things work and which where things may work better and which things work worse. And what is our history? What things have we seen in the past work well and what things have we seen in the past that didn't work? Does that imply what can work in the future? You know, that's, that is a geologic approach. What happened in the past tells us what's going to happen in the future. I think that's a, an approach that can lead you to a lot of success. And I, I do think it all come, comes back to this um, the, removing the sides and seeing the human beings on every side of every conversation and, and having a conversation and allowing someone to, you can see their personality and their emotion. You can see that if I, I might have referred to you as a climate skeptic and then someone gets in their mind this, oh, they must be this, this horrible person who's just, it just, it's just not true. Everyone's trying to live their life and take care of their family and produce a world that we all want to live in. And I think people need to understand that. And I think the only way they can is by humanizing people. Even the current president is still a person who's still trying to navigate the world and figure out how to do the things the way they want it done. Whatever you think of someone or not, just get in a room with them and, and have a conversation is what I would recommend to everyone. And that's why I love this show. And I'm so grateful for you coming on today and enlightening us with your thoughts, Debbie. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, everybody. Everyone have a fantastic day. Stay positive. Stay frosty. I love you all. It has been a pleasure and it has been changing the climate. And we will be back next week with another episode. Thank you all so much.